kind of flavour of your inbox, um, your constituents and the messages that you've been getting. Um, what have they been saying? And if you had to put a, a percentage on it, a proportion, is it is it is it fifty fifty kind of in support and and not in support of Boris Johnson? What number would you put on it? I've had um, hundreds of emails, um, well over five hundred, and uh, the overwhelming majority, at least uh, nine in ten, if not nineteen in twenty, are absolutely furious uh, and cannot understand. Uh, how all of this has happened. Goodness me, that's... Uh, I wasn't expecting you to say that. Um, and well, you, you asked the question, I, I feel that I should answer honestly. No, well, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. I didn't think it'd be 90, 90, 10. Um, and do you share that feeling of, of kind of incomprehension about how we've got here? Yes, I, I am angry too, but I take very seriously the ministerial code that we all sign up to and our responsibility when we stand up at the dispatch box to be accurate in what we say. And the Prime Minister has stood up at the dispatch box and set out his version of offence and apologised uh, profusely to the British public uh, if they think that he and his team have let them down. Mm. Um, I choose to uh, believe what the Prime Minister has said but I know that that's not good enough for many of my constituents. And that is why uh, it's right that there's an investigation. And as we saw yesterday, there are other people who have volunteered a different version of events that they're willing to offer under oath. And if we are keen to hear what has been said by those, then we need to wait until Sue Gray comes back with her report. OK. Um, you say that you accept his version of events. Do, do you accept him saying yesterday... Nobody told me it was against the rules. Yeah, I, because, I, I, again, I worked for the Prime Minister as his parliamentary private secretary, and so I spent a lot of time in Downing Street and a lot of time with him, and I've seen the extraordinary life that is that of our nation's Prime Minister, and I can well believe that uh, he was there working his way through an extraordinarily congested diary where dozens upon dozens of things happen in a day. And he may well have, um, for instance, bounced from a meeting on national security straight into a meeting with ministers on domestic policy, straight into a meeting with advisors on COVID, and then being grabbed by somebody uh, to out of his study to be taken downstairs to the garden, which is a walk that takes all of about 30 seconds. And the first time that what he was going into would have been brought into focus would have been in the pre-brief he had as he was going down the stairs. Mm. That, I, I, believe me, I, I've discussed this with lots mm. of constituents and there are plenty of them who are unwilling to give that the benefit of the doubt. But, you know, Sue Gray will have forensically gone through all of this and... We just need to see what Sue Gray's report comes back with. Of course. Um, I don't know if you saw the front page of The Independent on this subject. It said, I didn't know the rules, said man who made the rules. And I suppose that's that's the problem for a lot of people who, who aren't familiar with how a prime minister works and how congested his, his diary is. Do you think what's kind of striking to me is that it feels like, you know, it was a difficult time. We understand that, you know, the, the country was going through an un unprecedented pandemic and we know all that. Was he badly advised, do you think? Has he been let down? Well, I, I think that, uh, unfortunately, that is the bit of the last answer that I didn't say. I mean, if you are going through a day in which you are having calls with world leaders, meetings on national security, meetings on 10 different policy areas, all of those meetings come and go in the blink of an eye, you rely utterly on the team around you to make sure that you are properly briefed and to have your back around what it is that they put in your diary. Mm. Um, and I'm afraid to say, as unedifying as I think it is to, um, to, to point to those who perhaps don't have a platform with which to respond, but the reality is, is that the, those who work around the Prime Minister need to have his back. Mm. But we also hear that uh, you know Boris Johnson is not a, not a details man. He kind of gets bored with detail. So perhaps he should have been aware of what was going on as well. Well, I mean, I think that there is detail that you want the Prime Minister to have a grip of. And you know, the meetings that I sit in with uh, the Prime Minister on are 
meetings around national security, meetings around uh, COVID and what the intervention might be that we make there. Mm. Uh, and those are meetings in which I have always been struck that the caricature of Boris is not what you see in the National Security Council or COBRA. What you see there is a man that has read every detail, has all of the responsibilities of his office worn somberly, soberly on his shoulders, and he makes good decisions. Actually, I don't think any prime minister uh, is able, even if they wanted to, to manage their own diary and to take a view on each and everything that goes into it, okay. because there's just too much. Mm. Um, I want to ask you about these uh, MPs who are submitting or considering submitting uh, letters uh, to uh, the uh, 1922 committee. Um, Nadine Dorries has said the people who are doing this are being disloyal to the Prime Minister, the party, their constituents and the wider country. Do you think they're being disloyal? Uh, I, I prefer to, to, to use less colourful language. Um, I guess maybe you know, I was in Kiev last Thursday um, for some pretty serious business on behalf of the MOD uh, and I think you know, there's a time to use competitive language and it's at the Kremlin over what may happen in Ukraine, not necessarily between colleagues in the tea room. But I just say to colleagues that um, this is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, my mailbag is like theirs. All of our mailbags are like this. And all of us rightly have to wrestle with the competing loyalties of uh, wanting to work for and with a prime minister who has made fantastic decisions that has got this country through the pandemic in great shape um, versus the fact that our constituents are really angry right now. And I just think that this is not the time to be changing our Prime Minister. We are in an extraordinarily uncertain world um, in terms of security, in terms of the economy and in terms of the pandemic. And this feels to me like a time for cool heads. Let's see what Sue Gray comes back with and let the Prime Minister get on with delivering for our country. But, of course, Sugre's report could conclude that he did mislead Parliament. It, it, it may. And, as I said earlier on, ministers know that when they stand up at the dispatch box, they need to be accurate with their language. Uh, I sincerely hope the Prime Minister was. Uh, finally, you mentioned Kiev. I want to ask you about that, of course, as Armed Forces Minister. Do you think, well, how close, if at all, are we to a situation where British troops actually engage with Russian troops uh, over oh, the situation in Ukraine? No, no, nowhere near. Nowhere near. Uh, that, that is not a scenario that is uh, remotely realistic. Um, but Ukraine are our great allies. Uh, and the purpose of my visit last week was to close off uh, some extraordinary work done by my boss, Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, who has um, gifted the Ukrainian Armed Forces um, thousands of light uh, anti-tank uh, missiles. Uh, those are extraordinarily gratefully received by our great friends uh, in Ukraine. But the thing that I would use the short time that we have to talk about this mm. is just to say what stands in front of us, what could be weeks away, is the first peer-on-peer industrialised, digitised, top-tier army against top-tier army war that's been on this continent for generations. Tens of thousands of people could die. This is not something that people in, Bo in Moscow should believe to be bloodless. This is not something that the rest of the world should stand by and ignore. It's right that all diplomatic avenues are being exhausted. I just hope that as we're on the brink, people in Moscow start to reflect that thousands of people are going to die. And that is not something that anybody should be remotely relaxed about. Thank you for talking to us this morning. That is uh, James Heapy. He is the Armed Forces Minister. Mm -hmm.